The MFL 10 of death, one of the toughest leagues in all of fantasy. We're going to talk through some of the picks that have been going on over the last week or so with Sean's team, along with some of the other hardest hitters in the entire fantasy football industry. We have Pat Thorman, we have Danny Carter, Romy, we have JJ Zacharyson, and Sigmund Bloom, Mike Clay, Beers, obviously Mike Beers, uh, who has a strong history with Rotoviz, Scott Barrett, Lord Reeves, Adam Levitan, Ryan's in there too. Really, uh, you know, a, a tough row of draft competition to go up against. So we do this uh, each season. We jump into it as it's going on there in the 11th round. We'll see how much we go through today and talk through some of the strategy. But Sean, this league every year, um, one that I always like to see where some of the maybe differences to where ADP is currently trending to, some of the players that maybe some of the drafters have taken a stand on drafting at certain points, always fun. But uh, I'm sure you've been sweating it out in the draft room uh, with the competition. You're drafting in between Pat and Denny, so uh, some challenges, I'm sure, along the way. Yeah, and they have some similar approaches Denny obviously has been a big zero RB enthusiast, and he's always one of the most difficult drafters to contend with in the Apex Experts League that takes place every season early in August. This is the MFL 10 of death 11. So if some listeners are like, what's what's MFL 10? This is the 11th version there, and it has been so much fun. One of my favorite parts of it is that because this isn't you know, part of our portfolio, you're not trying to get those tiny ADP values. You want to win this league for bragging rights. You get some individual selections that do go away from ADP. People are just trying to get their guys and also maybe anticipate where some of these other big names will, you know, go in and grab someone. And so that part is so much fun. Colin, I feel very fortunate. I have the 102. It's hard to go wrong with your first pick there. The only tricky part when you have a pick on the edges is that it's difficult to anticipate, especially in a one-off where ADP isn't going to give you the same type of blueprint for what might come back. You've got to kind of guess what positional runs might occur and yeah. you know who you might need. I say that, but I, again, feel very fortunate that i have one of these first couple of picks you look at scott rich adam who have you know maybe a similar dynamic from the 10 11 12 spots and they don't get to have that great pick early in round one to help ops to help offset it so i have the second pick pat does take cd lamb with the first selection this is a one ppr with one for the tight ends as well you and I did a recent show for the Dynasty Reanimators talking about Christian McCaffrey and how he was one of these guys that we might want to ride to zero because of what he does for you in a Dynasty League, certainly also in individual seasons as well. Last year, he put up 24.7 points per game. It might surprise some people that it actually didn't gap the top wide receivers by that much. We have CeeDee Lamb with just a tick below 24. Tyreek Hill just barely below that. When you look at these three players being separated from the rest of the field, in a best ball league where it's a two running back, three wide receiver, one tight end start with a one flex, Colin, what are your thoughts on these first three picks and the direction that you should go, where you should draft Christian McCaffrey? Again, we mentioned on the previous show this week, the fantastic article by Jake Bose talking about wide receiver in a wide receiver heavy environment. That's definitely what we got in the MFL 10 of death and certainly what we expected to get. It was one of the reasons that I took Hill at the second pick instead of Christian McCaffrey your thoughts on whether that was the right direction to go well before we get into that answer sean you mentioned people might be wondering what mfl 10 is uh, i did see on twitter this week people talking about this being the fifth best ball summer and i know we're drafting a lot more best ball now but best ball is around for more than five years uh, i hope that people listening are aware of that mfl uh, i'm sure there's a lot of our listeners who took part in mfl 10 drafts back in the day but that was my 
gateway into best ball for sure over on my fantasy league but sean the pick itself there it's you know we've talked about this in the past if people want to take mccaffrey at that point it's it's very very fair particularly in the ppr format you took tyreek hill and i was interested to get your thoughts on hill you know this season because i mentioned people taking stands on specific players and this format and you know having some intriguing player names at certain particular spots off the draft the other part of it that you mentioned is is the three wide receiver format with the additional flex so you can start those four wide receivers it's going to be wide receiver heavy we know this draft room is going to push the wide receiver position and that for me would just give a slight edge towards the wide receiver over the the running back but when we look at both players we have Tyreek Hill obviously went you know to Miami and at that particular point you're wondering how things are going to work out is that a case that the Chiefs have thought you know we're better off without him and you know from their side they've you know won two Super Bowls in that time so from a team building perspective maybe they are but he has gone on in these last uh, couple of seasons they had 111 receptions in 2021 with the Chiefs but then goes to 2022 119 119 last year 1700 yards both seasons almost 1800 yards last year it's getting in the end zone as well so he is doing everything that you would want at a you know prime age wide receiver and at this point obviously he is kind of beyond what we would normally say about the peak but you did mention when we talked about Keenan Allen on the show earlier this week that some of these guys who hit such high peaks it can come down a little bit slower now the fear with somebody like a Tyreek Hill would be that you know losing his speed but that doesn't seem to be the case currently um but he is just at the the peak of his powers I feel at this particular moment in time and not only that I think that the offense that uh, Mike McDaniel has built is to kind of empower the traits that he possesses um and is getting the most out of him in terms of the motion and, and things around it like that and I also think that what the 49ers have done and interestingly these are two players obviously that have traded teams in the last couple of years but they have kind of done everything they can to give the opportunities and the success towards Christian McCaffrey and you look at that in a PPR setting you know 85 receptions 67 receptions last year and then to top that up with all the work that he can get in the running game 1100 yards 1400 yards rushing or the last two seasons but the touchdowns are the massive upside with Christian McCaffrey obviously got in the end zone 21 times last year so I think at the top end of drafts here, Sean, you can't really go wrong with either of those. And I think it comes down to what way people want to play it at that particular moment in time. But with it being the ability to start the four wide receivers, I, I, I like getting the wide receiver at that particular point off the, the draft. I assume that was kind of what you're thinking was there. Is there more? Hell's not a player that we've talked a huge amount about on the show. Um, Obviously, there's a, a huge... Uh, enthusiasm for a, another massive Tyreek Hill season this year yeah and it, it's always kind of fun talking about this one with Ben because he I think has a lean toward Hill and it's in part because Hill has been so extraordinary from a per route perspective you look at where he was last year going you know 0.7 ahead of the guys in second in terms of brandon Ayuk and nico collins when you're comparing him to a cd lamb you have this you know full yard again we're, we're talking sis numbers here but full yard in yards per route one of the things i think we want to keep in mind is that there was to balance that there was a 120 route advantage for lamb and i think that we can be comfortable with lamb being healthier i think we can be comfortable with the fact that he is going to run more routes again this season it's interesting when you jump over to look at expected points with these top three guys because they all do come in at or near the top in expected points as well but they don't have the field gapped nearly as much in that category but all three guys contributed five fantasy points over expectation per game so you're getting basically a touchdown worth of production from them that is efficiency based will that continue on into 2024 yes and no in terms of how we want to think through it and how we want to chase it right one of the reasons that Christian McCaffrey, CeeDee Lamb, and Tyreek Hill score so many points is that they're 
either the three best offensive skill position players in the NFL or in a group of four or five guys about which you could make that argument. It doesn't mean that you're going to hit that massive FPOE number every year, but it means you're more likely to hit it than other people. When you also are in such a great position from a volume perspective, then that one-two punch is what carries you into this range where you gap the rest of the guys. One of the things that you have to keep in mind, and again, this comes through in Jake's research, but it also comes through when you pull up the Roster Construction Explorer and look at Underdog versus FFPC when we were using the MFL 10 of death, which then transitioned into the best ball 10s. That RCE also demonstrating it. There is a meaningful difference in a 2-2-2 format versus a 2-3-1 format. And in many cases, that will swamp the half PPR element, right? So if it's two running backs, three wide receivers, and one flex, the best you can do is to start three running backs. If you have a 2-2-2 two, 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 where it's two running backs, two wide receivers, and two flex, you can get up to four running backs. So if you end up with additional running back firepower, if you have a Christian McCaffrey and you hit on your zero RB candidates, all of those guys can go in. And that matters. And so I have, and this may seem controversial to move it this much, but I do think that there is a top three and then arguably a top four with Jamar Chase. Because of the way underdog is structured, I think getting the wide receivers is so critically important that I also have Jamar Chase ahead of Christian McCaffrey. But in the 2-2-2 two, 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 in FFPC, I have Christian McCaffrey ranked number one. Now he's going number one in both. In one of those, I think it's, arguably a little bit of a mistake but when you look at that top group i don't have any problem with drafters taking them in any order that is more or less what happened in this draft where we get liam hill then he does take mccaffrey at three and then rummy takes chase at four the next real critical decision is when you get to five and you go with justin jefferson or amon's ross st brown because i don't think that that's really the Interesting point as we work through this draft, the rest of the first round, AJ Brown, then Mike Clay takes Brees Hall. And the balance there or the tension between taking either Hall or Bijan Robinson versus taking Puka and Garrett Wilson, that's the question that Mike uh, Clay and then Mike Beers and then Scott and Rich had to answer. We got Mike and scott and i say mike we get beers and scott barrett taking the receivers and then rich going with Bijan. but we do get different paths from that point we get back into the middle of round two and mike clay takes the controversial saquon barkley whereas rich then rattles off six consecutive wide receivers some of those wide receivers i think are also a little bit controversial in the Devonte adams one of these older guys who unlike keenan allen was not really himself last year or at least from a yards per target perspective he was well below his career numbers you get dj moore moore was one of the focal points of our last show amari cooper always an interesting name then you have rasheed rice with the suspension you get christian watson you get rasheed shaheed <sighs> the the New Orleans Saints offense is going to be very, very interesting this year. I do find it fascinating that people are gambling on that particular name, even though Shahid is electric on the limited number of targets that he does draw. So, Colin, we have the three running backs go in the first round. Then we do have that difference in the way that Mike Clay and Rich approached it. Mike has had a lot of success in both this league and the Apex Experts League kind of going against the tide and taking running backs. It will be interesting to me to see if that works in any way this year when the wide receiver avalanche is in such a full-blown mode or evidence because we get to the end of round six and 46 receivers have gone the running back 16 goes at the 701. It's also interesting because Mike takes three guys after Brees Hall. Brees Hall, superstar. The next three guys are pretty controversial in Saquon Barkley, Isaiah Pacheco, and Rashad White. I don't know if getting values on those three names 
do a lot for you. I do think that the receivers he then drafts make a lot of sense in rounds seven through 11, where you get Cortland Sutton, Mike Williams, Darnell Mooney, and Demario Douglas. Mike has been very effective at getting the best receiver values and the best receiver picks to complement when he goes RB early. What do you see on some of these other teams where I'm the only drafter to take six wide receivers in the first six rounds, but JJ doesn't take a running back until round eight. He gets Trey McBride and Lamar Jackson in there. That's a shot at the number one tight end, the potential number one wide receiver. Adam doesn't take a running back until round six. He gets Josh Allen and Dalton Kincaid in there. And a couple of the other teams that did draft the running back early, Denny takes McCaffrey, but then selects six consecutive wide receivers followed by David Njoku. Much of this you would expect and is completely baked in, but you definitely see the drafters, even when they take different approaches early, they're subsequently taking a draft construction and executing a draft plan that complements their early picks very nicely. Yeah, I would agree with that. They, like you know, all these guys, as I mentioned at the start of the show, extremely sharp drafters, some of the best fantasy football players in the entire world in this room. So, you know, when we talk about them, it's not a case of being critical or saying things are are not correct, but it's more just ob- observations on the team at this point. Mike, though, the interesting thing is you went through some of the moves that he made. Uh, Rashad White was the running back 14 taken at that particular point in the middle of uh, round six. So that was the 605. But he had four of those 14 on his roster. So when we look at this team and you know, you are the, the league and you said about some of the picks in the first round, but as we get back to the 206, Devin A. Chan is taken at that particular point as a running back seven. There is at the back end of that draft the two running backs in round one, then John and Taylor Gibbs, Saquon Barkley, and Achan. But then in round three, it's just Derek Henry. There's no running backs in round four. Then Pacheco, ETN, and Kyron Williams in round five. But then we get into that area where we see Rashad White drafted with Joe Mixon, James Cook, and Josh Jacobs. But interesting that, you know, with the 14 names gone off the board, that four of them are paired on that roster. And not only that, but then it is also a tight end added in there and Mark Andrews with Pittman. So really leaning into a different strategy than the entire rest of the board has done because that is the only running back, running back start. But throughout the the rest of the teams, there is only one running back through five rounds on the majority of them. You mentioned that you've got no running backs with the run of wide receivers there, but across the board, interesting, you know, to see those different strategies, but to see the running backs then pulled even further down in terms of the values and that's the part that can be tricky then is you know do you avoid them or do you continue to lean in to those selections for example in round four and round five you've taken keenan allen and Jaden reed where some of those other running back names that i've mentioned there would have been potentially available i also think that when we look at these boards every year and i think it is always interesting obviously it's the the strategy of this draft as well knowing that people are going to push quarterback to much much later in it versus if you're drafting it underdog of the ffpc and their best ball tournaments but josh allen goes at the 312 we get uh, jalen hurts at the four six then there's no quarterbacks taken in the fifth we get jackson and mahomes back to back in the mid sixth then it's richardson in the seventh no quarterbacks in the eighth then we see three guys go off the board and there's kind of a range here between round nine and round 11 where we see the quarterback six through the quarterback 14 go off the board so there's a lot of movement in that range kind of quarterback zone if you want to call it that but just the way these drafters are valuing the quarterback position maybe in a slightly different way and part of that's maybe you can answer this better sean is probably factored into knowing how the room is going to potentially play the position and being able to get some of those names later on rather than trying to get some of those real top end guys in an Allen or a hurts but the other one note, Sean, between the entire draft would be the, the tight end position. Um, we get Travis Kelsey as the tight end one to Romy uh, at the 3-4. Sam Laporta tight end two at the 3-7. I would imagine that Adam has paired Kincaid with Allen for that strategic purposes of the stacking element. He's the tight end three uh, at the 401. Mark Andrews goes at the 405. Trey McBride is the tight end five at the 408 i would imagine so far that's one of the 
through those opening four rounds one of the best values of the entire draft kyle pitts goes at the 412 to pat sean then gets his guy obviously brock bowers at the uh 8 11 which is another extreme value at the tight end position but no tight ends in round six they're going in the same order as we would kind of expect but i i find it interesting just the order of those guys and because it's not tight end premium as well the need for the tight end through those opening three rounds or four rounds sorry you get six tight ends off the board through four rounds george kittle then went in the fifth no tight ends in the sixth evan ingram in the seventh and then ferguson bowers and then joko in the eighth but i find that quite interesting as to how the tight end position has been valued here and then no tight ends in the ninth no tight ends in the tenth which i think there's obviously a huge tear break that we've talked about sean once you go past kind of that buyer's selection there um and then in the 11th we see goddard hawkinson and schultz go off the board so i i feel like those kind of areas the way i'm valuing quarterback this season and the way that i'm looking at the tight end position uh, are kind of reflected in how this draft is playing out so there's a lot of interesting elements to to run through i don't know if there's anything there that you want to what are your thoughts on kind of the tight end quarterback uh, evaluations throughout the the draft room here and so this is another league where i'm focusing really strongly on both my own preferences for playing a draft but also the historical results and what we know works and so one of the takeaways from jake's research that I think directly applies to this and what we know from the old days you know with the mfl 10s is that if you get those six receivers early you could potentially stop there and in this particular draft where denny took five in the first six rounds scott took five in the first six rounds rich took five in the first six rounds and only one drafter really sold at wide receiver i'm thinking that there is a massive tear break that happens around the jsn lad mcconkey area and so if you can get your sixth before that you're going to have this arguable superpower of having better players but also saving a roster spot and those two things together trump almost any other consideration for me then you slide into this element where we also know that elite tight end and potentially double elite tight end is dynamic in this format the elite tight end was always one of the things that showed up in the rce as being a huge trump card in this format so because mcbride didn't get back to me because pitts didn't come through the four or five turn I was never really in a position where tight end made the most sense until round seven. And then the decision comes down to, do you take the guy that you think is the value there in Brock Bowers, or do you take the other tight end who is also a really strong value on the assumption that a, (laughs) you don't really want to keep pushing Bowers ADP higher if you can help it, but then B he's more likely to come back and he did come back and one of the things Sean, that was looking, an extraordinary move to go from the 702 to the 811 and and hold out the buyers was going to get back we did see ferguson and, and then joko go in between i'm sure there was some nerves waiting for that pick to make it back to you well one of the things when you're looking at a full season league and that's what this is so this is going to be more similar to the marathon in underdog right drafters are going to be a little bit more skeptical of specific rookies where maybe they don't think they're going to score early so i thought that was the other part of it okay, fair that point. might happen here and it was even part of my own calculation when i selected Devonte smith instead of malik neighbors at the two three and if he had come back i probably would have taken him but i selected smith at the 211 because there were both 49ers receivers who were kind of the other guys that i had at that same ranking level i'm like i don't think that pat is going to take both 49ers here one of them will come back through whereas Devontae smith if i don't take him more likely to be selected so even though adp in most formats is flipped i went ahead and took the eagles player first i pushed the 49ers guys debo samuel is the player i did select coming back out of that that's a good strategy though that we haven't talked about if your draft not the turn with particularly those two players but there's a couple of offenses that the 
the positional players are very tight and we're kind of separating them by who's going second. I think that was a, a very smart move at that point. And so it was tough to pass on a Malik neighbors, but I did think this was the right type of draft to do it where if he is a little bit slow in the first half, you're probably giving away points in a full season contest. You don't need to give those points away. A similar type of thing, I think for the drafters who take Ferguson, who take Njoku, I think Ferguson, I mean, I think Njoku is undervalued. And so I think that Denny gets a good price on him at the eight ten. I probably would have taken him at the eight eleven if he had been the guy who came through instead. Although one of the things I was trying to figure out how to do was if Bowers isn't there, how would I get both Jalen Warren and Raheem Mostert? But he was there, so it wasn't a huge deal. I was just hoping that Pat wouldn't take both Warren and Mostert at the 8-9 turn. He did take Judy and Warren, with which left Mostert for me. But to be able to get the first six wide receivers and then to get those two tight ends, that then sets me up to save a roster spot at both positions now you're going to have to redeploy that somewhere and you may still decide that the wide receiver or the tight end later is the best player available and you go ahead and use the pick there but you want to set yourself up to where you don't necessarily have to and so i love the fact that that happened one of the things we then see is that no tight ends were drafted for the next two rounds so the community did believe that there was a big tear break there i felt fortunate to be on the right side of it take most in nine And then you get back in round 10 and most of the running backs who would have been interesting are gone. Chase Brown goes in the middle of 10. And so Colm, I was trying to figure out how I needed to draft this, if there was any way to draft it so I could get both Jordan Love and Kyler Murray. Pat hadn't selected a QB yet. Both of those guys were pretty big ADP values. If you want to look at some other formats and say, this is how, in general best ball drafters are valuing these guys it seemed like there was a slightly better chance that it would happen if i went murray love but it just i made the decision that he was going to take one of those two guys whoever i passed and even though murray has the early aep and even though you and i talked about him on a recent show as being one of the best values in the ffpc Superflex tournament I went ahead with love here in very small part because of Jaden Reed. There are some elements where if Jaden Reed has a big season, then it's more likely that Jordan love will have a big season. That would be a similar thing to Adam's bet with Josh Allen and Dalton Kincaid. If Kincaid goes off much more likely that Allen has a big season, there isn't the element where you're worrying about a big week 15 or 16 or 17 score, right? That part doesn't come into play. So I wasn't that concerned about it. If I had thought I could get both guys, then I would have, have taken kyler murray even without an arizona cardinals player but when it came through he does take murray i selected caleb williams instead of going back to a second running back in part because i thought there was the potential for a little bit of a qb run to develop that hasn't happened it'll be interesting to see if it happens in 12 but column one of the things that shows up in the roster construction explorer in underdog for 2023 was that if you have this six early wide receiver and two QBs in the window, your results were fantastic. Not just good, not just great, but like, I mean, they were extraordinary, right? Sure there is. The two QB in the window across all of those years of the main MFL 10 participation, two QB in the window was the dominant approach. And again, there was nothing close. Taking two QBs in the window gave you a massive competitive advantage. I'm not necessarily saying that 2024 will turn out that way. There are other things that could happen. But given that I didn't think the running backs who went between 11 and 12 were going to be the guys who completely determined the league, didn't necessarily believe there are like clear-cut league winners there, I went ahead and took the second QB even though I only have one running back, this is another move to potentially save a roster spot. Now this is a 20 round draft, but it's also a draft that includes defenses. And again, you go back to the MFL 10 days and you know that three defenses is usually an advantage. If you select three defenses, then it's a 17 
round draft. So one less than you're used to getting an underdog. That being the case, if you take these two QBs and you stick with two QBs, again, you give yourself flexibility. I can now just go running back, running back, running back, running back, take all of my favorites. That's the way I'm looking at this. But I wanted to ask you what you would have done in some of these rounds because there were a lot of fun decisions to make. We went ahead and discussed that 2-3. It sounded like you were comfortable with taking Devontae Smith and letting the 49ers come through. The 4-5 was certainly interesting because the other two guys I was looking at were the two players that Pat took on the turn. So when it came to me in round four, I already had three receivers. The elite tight end is a big difference maker in this, and Kyle Pitts was available. Also, if you have the three early receivers and a running back falls way down the board, then one of the things you can do is take advantage of that, especially being out on the end, not knowing who else you're going to get. Kyron Williams was still available. Kyron Williams was available at the four or five turn. Now, some of that is what we're getting here where there are concerns about both his foot and how much value he might lose to Blake Corum, even if he's healthy. But I mean, Kyron Williams at the four or five turn after what he did last season, what would you have done on the clock at the four eleven? I think the toughest part of this is the players that you're mentioning here. So you took Keenan Allen, Kyle Pitts was a consideration, Kyron Williams was a consideration, then you take Jaden Reed. When we look at the names that are kind of going beyond that, it's DeAndre Hopkins, Hollywood Brown, Chris Godwin, Calvin Ridley, Deontay Johnson, Rice, Addison at wide receiver. Were they obviously then went after Christian Watson as the next group of receivers? We talked about Adunze on our show earlier this week. He goes in there. So there's a lot of interest in wide receivers in that range. But I do think that Keenan Allen and Reed are above that. I think then like Deontay Johnson, Addison, were they they would be the next group that I'm reaching for if I was going that way. So if Reed hadn't I mean there, if Reed gets taken at the turn and Williams is there, it would be a consideration. But without that happening, I think I would go with the two wide receivers over that. And because of the two wide receivers that it is in Allen that we talked about on the show earlier this week with the Bears and Reed, I think I would I if I'm not if I'm not on the clock, I don't have that pressure of knowing that you know five tight ends have gone off the board and there is going to be at least those 22 picks before it comes back to you so uh, i may have gone with the the pets pick there over allen and hope that i ended up with allen and pets so take pets at that pick and then allen come true but it's very very close and it's very very tight and then with the hindsight playing out that you get Bowers and ingram at the seven and eight turn i think this is worked out pretty much perfectly for you but it's very very close it's razor thin in terms of making those decisions at that particular point off the draft so i i I think at the end of the season we'll know the right and wrong answers but i i would have probably hoped to come away with that with uh pets and allen but getting allen and reed is a, a really nice takeaway there i'm assuming that it was quite close for you and that decision there to to pass on pets it was. It was even actually a little bit harder to pass on Kyron Williams because one of the things I was thinking is that I'll be able to get the receivers in one way, shape, or form. And if you get five, then you can take your favorite players who come through. Pat does take Jerry Judy at 812. If Brock Bowers hadn't gotten back to me at the 811, then Jerry Judy is someone I would have really liked yeah. there. And so you could make that pick. But, but with if, the way it worked out, wasn't there, I, I think part of the reason I would go with the wide receivers there is if he, if Byers wasn't there, I think that Warren probably becomes the pick. You pick up Byers and Mostert, and it was Judy and Warren that went at the turn. But uh, I think that Warren would probably be the selection there if you because you've taken those wide receivers early. And I was thinking that he probably was going to take one running back and not two. If I had taken Warren, I think that he probably would have taken most most her, but yeah. you don't know that for sure let me put it a slightly different way christian kirk goes with the 410 if keenan allen is selected 410 and christian kirk is the guy who gets at 411 and you're looking at taking Jaden reed at the 411 and then maybe taking jordan addison at the 502 yeah. because that's probably the next receiver name on my board i 
it's not that I think these are bad picks in any way, shape, or form, but I guess I think there is less upside for, and this is a, a wide receiver heavy round, but I'm not sure that DeAndre Hopkins, Hollywood Brown, Chris Godwin, Calvin Ridley, Deontay Johnson, Rasheed Rice, all of those guys are in worse situations for me than Jordan Addison is. It was actually a little bit of a difficult pick between Jaden Reed and Jordan Addison there. Would you have gone Reed and Addison if Keenan Allen hadn't been available? Because that was one of the things for it too. I think that if Keenan Allen is gone, I probably go ahead and take Kyron Williams. Well, I think if Allen's gone and Pitts is still there, Pitts becomes the pick. But if Pitts is gone and Allen's gone, I think that I would have went with Jaden Reed and potentially Williams at that particular point because I I would say that I would have some interest in Deontay Johnson and then Jordan Addison's the other player along with Worthy. They were the three names that I kind of mentioned at the, the last point. Uh, if you're making the question if Allen and Pitts are gone, I think it's Williams and one of those wide receivers. But I still think that, you know, it's Allen then. I think kind of the order that they've gone in ADP, Allen then Pitts, but I would have skipped over Williams for Reed at that point. And then I would go Williams into the Deontay Johnson, Jordan Addison range. So then the next decision comes at the 611. I take Jackson Smith and Jigba. The other option there in another Kenneth situation Walker. where Pat took the guy that I probably would have selected is Kenneth Walker there. He gets McConkey and Walker at the turn. I thought those were fantastic picks. Would you have taken Walker already having five running backs, try and push JSN through there and get him at the 701, 702, knowing or thinking ahead to probably not take Brock Bowers and see if he falls? See, the, the trouble you get into there is if you take Kenneth Walker hoping that JSN gets through, even if JSN gets through, you have the option to take Evan Ingram or you mentioned at the time when you were drafting Brock Bowers was in consideration as well so the trouble is if you pass then on uh, Evan Ingram at that particular point anyway you're obviously not knowing the Bowers gets back to you in the following round but you could be really locked out at the tight end position then as you move through the rest of the draft so I think that the Ingram pick was something that had to be done I think it was a case of going between Walker or jsn at that particular point i don't think you would probably have got both of those guys well i don't think i would have drafted both of those guys and passed on the the tight end when we're down to the the point of ingram at tight end eight at that particular point of the draft uh, I, I would be very comfortable taking kenneth walker there over jsn because you have the the five receivers previous um that would that would have been more of a pivot point potentially for me than the the kyron williams selection option at the the last pick i think Adam Walker in there would have been would have been perfectly fine on this team, but I think you needed to take the tight end then. So when you're making that pick at the six eleven, are you considering like are you happy that you get JSN and Walker and pass completely on tight end at that range? Is that something you're considering? Because I think that would be an area where I would feel the pinch and, and go with the tight end at that particular point. Because if it's a case that Bowers and Joku, I'm not really drafting much Ferguson. If Bowers and Joku get wiped out, then across that course of that round which i think by looking at how the draft played out with no tight ends taken in rounds nine and ten i feel like there's a chance that those guys would have uh, come off the board with how the aggressive tight end was to that point i, I would have felt very hard to pass up on on ingram there are buyers but your point on the rookie tight end maybe taking a little bit of time makes sense to, to take ingram there first yeah i was going to ask you the other you know tricky part of that for me again with no running backs through six rounds and values resulting from the adp context or the specific players selected ramondre stevenson also there were ramondre stevenson after walker goes stevenson was actually the guy i got the choice of so you see stevenson yeah. and deandre swift and we talked about swift on the previous show as well and as aaron jones a, and aaron That's jones not. Yeah. So those are kind of the three guys, yeah. I think if, if you've you taken are... pets, if you've taken pets earlier, you, in that situation, I think you take JSN and another running back. If you have pets on your roster, I think you you can make that decision easy. So if you're linking those together, if pets is taken at the four eleven, then you take Reed, and then you 
take Walker over JSN potentially. Or even if you take JSN, you can then skip on Ingram at that point and take Stevenson. I think that's where the like it, it's a case that I think you have to have a tight end at that round seven point that you take it at. Yeah, and I think that you're probably right. I do think that there is an element where one of Njoku or Bowers, I felt that there was a 50-50 chance would come back to me, which is what happened. And the reason that I went ahead and tipped Evan Ingram in a full PPR, he ran 75 more routes last season than the next closest tight end. And in the research I've been doing on this three receiver situation for the Seahawks, it's also become clear that Doug Peterson is a good guy for supporting a lot of different receiving weapons, including potentially a tight end. Now, is that gap going to be the same in 2024 now that they have both Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas to go with Christian Kirk? I think that you want to be wary. And at the same time, it wasn't all route volume. There was also the ability to draw targets. The 25% targets per route does put him below guys like McBride and Kelsey and Laporta. But I mean, he's the next name in there. When you're talking about being ahead of Mark Andrews, being ahead of Dalton Kincaid, ahead of George Kittle, you know, way ahead of Jake Ferguson in terms of also drawing routes on a per target basis when you have that massive routes advantage. Any little jump that he gets this season in the yards per target element which you know he may not necessarily get one of the reasons you're getting so many targets is because you've got this underneath roll his a dot last year was shallow that lends itself to being a kind of ppr guy and a fit here so that's why i took him i do think that you could have passed him i do think the running backs who went in that range were interesting so that'll be something to track as we go along this year Colin, anything jump out to you in terms of picks that were made that seem to be flag plant selections uh ryan took uh, aj brown at the 107 that was wide receiver six i thought that was quite a you know bold selection we get reeves taking Devonte adams at the 202 pretty pretty bold there and even the mike clay selection it was running back six but it's barkley at the 205 obviously when you're looking at those first two rounds those stand out but denny to cooper cup at wide receiver 15 that was at the 210 and obviously some of these are getting pulled up because of wide receiver selections but i've mentioned cups adp maybe being a bit too split from pukas but that's a lot earlier than i would have envisioned him going in this particular draft we get mike evans at the 301 um the other picks then you know i mentioned some of the tight end selections but looking down through the rest of the board i think some of the spots where players are going is because they're getting pulled up through just the sheer volume of the wide receivers being drafted um when i look through the overall board though sean i think you might have some names that are standing out to you more so than that but they were the the names in those early rounds that stood out to me but the other part is, you know, we've done a lot of discussions around your your tight ends, the selection pivot points at tight end for you. There's only one team so far in this draft with no tight ends. That is Reeb's team, um, who did start off with B. John Robinson, then added James Conner, Tony Pollard. After that, you mentioned the wide receivers. They had drafted through those opening seven rounds then, but did add po- uh, Jalen Polk and then added Brock Purdy and the 11th but the no no tight ends there uh so far and you've mentioned you know the the two white the two quarterbacks that you've drafted giving you that positional flexibility later on uh, obviously there's a, a strength in his roster which will be you know tony pollard james connor and Bijan robinson whereas at the moment you just have the most pick but i i do feel like you're probably into a minimum of three tight ends on that roster if not four tight ends which kind of it'll be interesting to see how the next you know eight rounds plays out from this point forward so i think that, that could be a difficult one to to tie back together uh, with the tight end position but any any players that i didn't mention there do you agree that you know those players i mentioned are a little bit higher than we would be normally looking at them was what was the standout p- picks for you that you thought might have been the flag plants but those were the ones that i noticed yeah rich made several including i think omari cooper at wide receiver 20 six 
I think that given all the buzz around Jalen McMillan, that Chris Godwin going in the middle of round five at wide receiver 36 to Sigmund Bloom, he's still definitely saying, you know, look, this guy is going to score. I mean, that pick comes before Calvin Ridley, before Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson, a little bit of, you know, a few slots early to Scott there. Deontay Johnson is somebody that we think should be going earlier. So I think that makes sense. Christian Watson is another one. We have Tyler Lockett at wide receiver 47 with Keon Coleman still available. We've sort of talked about how Lockett might be an undervalued play. Coleman is somebody who, again, in this particular format, where it's just full season, might move down a little bit. But I think it's a nice value for JJ there, even if you're off of Keon Coleman. I think that's a nice value there in round seven as wide receiver 48 to go with the the Trey McBride fall, I think is the most surprising to me to get Kelsey first ahead of Laporta, but then also to get Kincaid and Andrews ahead of McBride. Those are maybe surprising picks at the tight end position. I did like seeing Rummy grab Travis Etienne at the 504. I think that's a fantastic value for him there. Etienne was actually the other player I was considering when I selected Jaden Reed. I don't think Etienne should go in that spot. He should be gapped from players like Pacheco and Rashad White and Josh Jacobs by more. So we look through there and we see a number of interesting picks. We also get the aggressive selection of Jaden Daniels as QB6. That one I thought was fun. You know that I love Jaden Daniels. As a result of that, though, Mike Beers gets CJ Stroud at QB7 late in the ninth round, just one pick ahead of Joe Burrow. The gap between Patrick Mahomes in round six, which you can't complain about Mahomes in round six, that's obviously completely justifiable. But to be able to get CJ Stroud more than three rounds later, in an environment where I think he's 50 50 to outscore him that stands out as the pick of the draft to me Colin, and this is where you can get in a little bit of trouble or your structure is going to occasionally take you off of somebody you would have liked I talked about all of the ways in which you can save roster spots by approaching the first eight rounds the way I did it also probably took me out of consideration for Stroud because I absolutely had to grab the what I consider to be a pretty big value on Raheem Mostert had to take a guy to be sort of the foundation running back there I did consider Stroud with getting Jordan Love and Caleb Williams I like the way that that turned out but I love that value for Mike Beers yeah and I think it's pretty awesome again as we get to run through this ADP obviously Sean Drafton and it given us access to it to look through it but hopefully people have enjoyed some of the conversation and thought points and talking about potential selections but we'll see how the rest of the draft plays out Sean and obviously wishing Sean good luck again this season in the MFL 10 of death that is going to do it for this edition I do want to put one note as we get ready to finish up I have been looking for people to join us in the dynasty drafts we've had a, a huge amount of interest more than i had envisioned getting so we have closed the entries for people to have a chance to draft with myself and sean in that dynasty league i'll be getting in touch with the people who have contacted us obviously not everyone will be able to get in but we will set that up and hopefully we'll have some shows coming up in the coming weeks talking through some strategy some more dynasty reanimators from myself and sean about the startup draft because we haven't we've talked about some of sean's startup drafts we haven't done any together or at the same time against each other so we'll we'll see how it all plays out looking forward to that if you're signing up over at rotoviz.com use the promo code rv radio 2024 at checkout to save 10 percent and get access to all of the content and tools over there my name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Over to Martin. My co-host, as always, is Sean Siegel. Check out Sean's work up on rotaviz.com. And until we are back, have a good one.